How did you get into all this programming malarkey originally? Well, it, I was a professional programmer. I, I used to work for an insurance broker in Witten, mm. and um, I became interested in microcomputers when I, I saw all these magazines, and mm. I've, I used to play arcade games in the pub, and I thought, oh, I could do one of these. But the, the machine at, at the time that, that was around was the old Z80, and mm. it, it was impossible to get an in, a moving picture on the the screen. Every time you you ran a program, it just went, all went grey, mm. and then you got the, the results up. So I I kind of um, disassembled the um, machine to try and find out how it would work to see if I could change that so I could get a picture up and the program going. And mm. and I did manage to do that in the end, but. Uh, mm. Just about when I did that, the, the ZX81 come out and, and I was just so fed up that <laughs> uh, all my work was virtually for nothing. Although it, it was good introduction because I, I learned Z80 doing that and I learned how the machine worked. I learned how it was doing the display and all sorts of things. Hmm. Hmm. And before all that, did you go to university? Did you have a code on the university machines? No, I... I was on the dole for years rather than go to university. And then I saw a government course so um, which, which um, paid you to go to college to learn to program. All right. I think it, was, it was about a six week course. Hmm. And um, yeah, it, it was the most money I'd ever earned, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I learned to a profession that that was learning COBOL and from there, that allowed me to get a job in the civil service, and I used to work for the uh, the VAT people. Um, right. And they gave gave me a listing that was about uh, a foot deep, hmm. uh, you know, thousands. Of, and they said, "Oh, that's your program, and when there's amendments, you've got to put them in there, so hmm. you you know get to know it." And hmm. I did that, and I for about nine months, I didn't have anything to do. And then there was one little change of about two lines of code and I, I got really fed up doing that <laughs> uh, so so they said bring in some library books so I did and I bought in a book of origami and I made little paper animals and put them all over my desk and uh, <laughs> the, the uh, person in charge didn't didn't care for it so I got moved to another unit which was the best thing that happened to me because they had loads of programming to do and I, I was writing new programs mm. and uh I really loved it. I mean, I'm the kind of person who wants to be busy doing things. Even though I'm retired now, what do I do all day? I sit and program just because I love doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a cold as well. Um, so um, it was 3D Space Wars, wasn't it? Your first proper title. It, it was. And I, I did that um, sitting in the lounge watching telly with, with a little black and white telly and the spectrum in in front of it and it, it took about six weeks to do I, I wish i could write a program in six weeks now i mean my, my last uh, <laughs> program that I've, I've been writing on well over six years <laughs> <laughs> so what was your programming setup back then it, it literally was a spectrum a tape recorder and a tv that was it <laughs> <laughs> and how did you hook it with the uh, um when I had the game kind of all virtually finished, mm. I sent it to three publishers. I think they were Quicksilver, Silversoft, and Hewson. Mm. And I got a rejection from Quicksilver. And I, I got um, two letters that would come up and see me from, from the other two. And I, I went to to see both publishers. And of, of the two, Hewson's impressed me he had an in-house duplication plant right and i thought that was a really canny move because i thought well you know he, he hasn't got to um try and guess how many that's going to sell and pay mm -hmm. all money out to, to do that he can keep costs to a minimum just run them off when when he wants yeah. um so so i went with him and i immediately kind of bonded with him he actually went to my school i didn't realize it it was a couple of years older than me Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, Rayleigh Swains. So um, yeah. he he knew the area. 
so, so very like-minded. He he was a very kind of technical person for a publisher, which was good because you you could go to him and you, and you could talk about programming type technical things, and and yeah. he'd he'd kind of understand your problems, you know, rather than it all just going over his head. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, when did you um, join forces with Andrew Braybrook? When when did all that come about? Well, very, very soon after I left work, when I got my first contract, hmm. I, I handed in my notice straight away because I thought, I want to make the, the best of this. I'd, I'd saved up a whole year's wages and I thought, right, I've got a year to make or break. And, hmm. Yeah, let's just enjoy it. If it carries on, it carries on. If it doesn't, the worst I, I can do is is lose a year's wages. And, and my, my boss says, look, we'll have you back any time, yeah. you know, so, so I, I knew I had I kind of had an escape path, but after a couple of weeks, just sitting in the room programming on my own, I I, I was kind of getting stir crazy, and I knew Andrew was he was secretly programming three D Space Wars on his dad's dragon, and it it showed me a, a bit. So I just went round his house and um, said, do, "Do you want to work for me?" And he says, "Yeah, okay, let's go down the pub." And I I knew Andrew. Um, I played in a local band, um, hmm. and and then Andrew played in another band, and and his band invited me to go down and uh, hmm. j- join them. So for a while I was in both of them, but but then then um, one black band split, so I was just with Andrew's band. I, I also knew him from the pub because um, he'd he'd be playing the Space Invaders machine hmm. sort of all night and. And that's that's where where I'd be. So uh, we 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 had a, a friend who used to work at at um, the insurance brokers that, that I programmed mm. for, and and he introduced me to Andrew one, one evening. And says, "Oh yeah, this this chap writes programs on a mainframe," and uh, yeah. So we we immediately kind of started talking all about programming and and, mm. and things. And um, he he did give me a huge deck of cards um computer cards it's back in the old, old days um mm. to to try and run on our mainframe but I, I i did give them to the operators but i i don't think they, they ever, ever got it going <laughs> <laughs> so uh when, when you worked uh, with uh Yusun, um did you basically have control over the, your own output because you decide what games to do yourself or we we very much just just went to him with a game and said, look, this is what we're doing. And it's, it, oh, great, great. Sometimes he'd, he'd um, say, what about so-and-so? Or what, what's it going to do? But, mm. but generally, he was absolutely thrilled to bits with everything we we took up. I, c- I can remember when Andrew first went up with Gribbley's Day Out, mm. um, it, he, he didn't quite understand the concept of the game because it, it had... A, the, these kind of triangles that you switched on and off to kind of travel around the, the thing and and um he, he he wasn't keen on that at all he, but because game wise i don't think Houston had a, had a lot of imagination i can mm. remember taking him avalon and all i had w- was the room and i had a wizard who fired wizard and picked up wizards and opened wizards to pick wizards out of them because that's the only graphic i had in the game right. and uh, <laughs> But that one, he immediately thought, "Wow, this is something different." And mm. uh, but it, it, it was nice because um, y- you could go there, and he he talk about the technical side of it. And he he had a brother, Gordon Hewson, who used to be more or less the games manager, and he'd understand the game side of it. Hmm. Mm. How did you get the idea for Avalon? Because it wasn't um, around about that time. There's a lot of spacey side games, wasn't there? And it was sort of one of the first, you know, fantasy based games, wasn't it? Role playing game. That's right. Well, well I used to play a, a, a game like D and D with Andrew and his friends, hmm. and I thought it'd, it'd be really good if I could get that into a game. And uh, I'd, I'd seen um, Attic Attack and hmm. how. I felt that gave you a good sense that you're in a place just with kind of wireframe rooms. And I thought, well, if I can bring the camera so, so that you're looking into the room, mm. I I could get what I called a virtual theatre kind of view. 
yeah. to really put you in the scene. And I, I felt that would re really make it immersive. And I, I tried it out on paper, just sketching out the rooms. And I, I had a, a kind of frame that I made out of one piece of paper. And, and I, I kind of scrolled by hand my drawing of the room behind. And I thought, this is going to work. You, your mind yeah. just accepts it. Mm. But it's, it's quite weird. When you go through a door, the, the orientation completely changes. But mm. it, you're so used to that because in films, when someone goes through a door, the camera doesn't follow you through a door. You then get the view of the new room. Yeah. And your mind just accepts it. Mm. And it, it, it was a joy that because it it just worked far better than, than I, I thought it, it would. And, yeah. and you kind of had this continuity and this feeling then that you were in a real place. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's a, I hate to use the phrase blew my mind, but it did at the time. <laughs> Just moving rooms and the uh, the zooms and so on, you know. Um, how long did it take you to get the balance right with the spells? The, the, the game as a whole, I think, took me three months, which, which oh. is incredibly quickly. When, when yeah. I, I think, well, it was so revolutionary. But the, the um, I I kind of added the spells incrementally, mm. and as I I kind of got one of them working, I thought, oh, then I can do this, and now I can do this. So I, I started off with with just spells which which were the the kind of spell where, where you just fire a missile, and then I thought, oh, well that that could actually cause an event, so I could use that to do other things, and then I thought, oh. Let's have a kind of spell which you can move around like a cursor. Hmm. Um, and I think that part of it came very, very smoothly. The, I, I wasn't sure how I was going to do the picking up of things and the, the dropping of, of things. But then I, yeah. it, it was through playing around with a couple of spells. And I thought, oh, if I had a spell that looked like something, something like a hand that mm -hmm. you could pick up. And, and so I invented the little servant spell. And that's, that's probably one of the first examples of a, of a cursor being used in a game. Mm. Um, you know, especially on on a home micro, and uh, it it took a while to kind of get the feel of that, and so I could control it because, unfortunately, you you only had the left, right, up, down joystick. So you, so if you wanted to get the, across the screen quickly, you 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 had to either move it quick, and I found oh that was a bit uncontrollable. So so then mm. you think, okay, well I'll accelerate it. So you start off slow, but get get up to speed, and. Um, that part of it probably took longer than than to trying to work out the spells the the method for the adventure just kind of came virtually from the spells so i was thinking well the spells have got to cause events so i need a, a system that is event driven and i suddenly realized i can control the whole adventure like that so objects kind of listened for a particular event in their mm. kind of area and when they found that event, they changed from one state to another. And that essentially was the key to, to the whole game. And once I, I got that kind of little loop done, so objects could go through a series of states, and, and then I could link up all the objects so, so that, okay, if you take one object, because each object listened for event, but also put out an event, mm. and those events changed depending on the state. So, say, a locked chess was listening for the key. Hmm. Once it got the key, then it listens for the um, presence of the wizard or the, or the servant. And then the thing inside would be given a signal to change from invisible to visible and from untakeable to takeable. So uh -huh. I had a few bits which kind of like, like um, told the game that the state of things. Hmm. And... Um, I I I realised yeah I could get a huge adventure in this because th that was about eight bytes long mm. for each state and I I think I managed to get two hundred and fifty six steps to the adventure which which if you compare similar adventures like Night Law I mean Night Law was very pretty but the solution of it is about twelve lines 
Mm. You look at the solution of of Avalon, and it, it's pages. <laughs> so, so you yeah, you know, you're getting a lot more to kind of think about, and uh, it, it was a completely different type of uh, game. So, so it, I, I think it was a true merger of the kind of adventure style of game. Mm. and the arcade style of game and and people didn't get that at first because it was a totally new concept yeah was it difficult to fit all that into the spectrum it it was and the size of the spectrum was was one of the biggest problems and because not only have you got to get the gaming while you're developing it you've got to get any tools that you need to develop Mm. and that's why I didn't use an assembler at the time because there was no way I could fit an assembler in the machine right. and the code to, to run the, the game so uh, mm. I, I used to write in hex and and I wrote a little loader which was very small in in um, assembler that that read all the rem statements in basic and and changed those mm. into code and then when the game started, it overwrote all all of the the lines of of the basic. It kind of closed basic down to mm. to give me the machine. But it meant you had to really kind of think about well, how how are you going to uh, cram graphics in? And and so graphics, like I, I didn't have a different left and right facing graphic. Mm. I I had a a system that that could uh, mirror the the graphics. Hmm. And they were the sort of wheezes that we were using, yeah. plus a system that kind of compressed the, the graphics so any white space in the graphics wasn't in memory. The, the graphics were divided into a set of columns that only started on the first pixels I had to draw. And that, that speeded up plotting as well, because you were never plotting empty space. Hmm. Hmm. How did you? Ref- what did you refine um, on the next game, uh, Dragon Talk? You know what? What advances did you add to Avalon to get to Dragon Talk? I I um, revised the plot system just a little bit because hmm. I nearly one of the first things I I did when I finished the game was to have a look at the plot system and think: well, is there any way I can speed this up? Hmm. And and I I, I tweaked it j- just just here and there, but but not majorly. Most of of the the thing, I I decided I wanted more interaction with the um, enemies, mm. and I thought, well, I could have have some allies as 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 well. So, I I invented a system where where I gave them a kind of friendly factor. They already had a fear factor, right? But th- this time, the race kind of had a a kind of well, how much it likes you factor. Hmm. And that could be influenced by what you did in the game. So, you know, if you go around and you're nasty to them, they're going to hate you. But if you're nice to them, you can kind of win them over, hmm. especially the elves. And then they start off kind of neutral, but you you, you give them gems and the sort of things that elves like, and um, they, they start following you around and killing your enemies for you. Mm. Which which was really important. In one of the, the end rooms of the game is have got invisible guardians in, and if if you lead the elves into there, the elves will fight all the invisible guardians for you, rather mm. than you you get in uh, killed by them. So, mm-hmm. I I kind of made kind of full use of that. I I also um watching people play it people were having difficulty with the doors so i i made the the virtual doors wider than than they actually look on the screen since mm. you can actually go through the the um the, the door posts in in effect just so to make it a little bit more playable also some of the scenes didn't have doors at all like like the um wood scene mm. i I also saw people were getting very frustrated if they were trying to get um, some magic going and mm. something started attacking them. It was very difficult to get back to the move spell to move. So I I got a, I, I thought well, if I use the joystick sideways, I, I can say, right, that's, that's a get out of trouble kind of action. So so you can break out of the uh, the, the, the spell book just, just with, with one single action. Mm. 
especially when, when when you're panicking. So there are a few little kind of refinements like that, which I think made it a, a far slicker game to to play. Yeah, but unfortunately, it didn't sell as as much as the the first one. Houston's theory was, well, people learned they couldn't play the first one, so didn't <laughs> play by the, the the second one, which was a shame because the second one, in effect, was a lot easier. Yeah, because um, of those few things for the people who liked adventures and and weren't so good at the arcadey bits. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Astro Clone, that was more sort of sci-fi themed, wasn't it? Why did you switch from fantasy to sci-fi for that? It, it was really Houston's influence. He was basically saying, well, if you look at a graph of how many Dragon Talk have sold compared to Avalon, yeah. and you extrapolate it, you're not going to sell hardly any. Yeah. And I, I thought, OK, well, I've got to do something else. So I... The biggest overhaul was the graphics engine. I thought, well, I'd, I'd been tweaking the graphic engine since 3D Space Wars, but hadn't really made major changes to it. Mm. And I'd heard of some new techniques, like building um, the screen in an off-screen buffer mm. and then whizzing it onto the screen at the last minute to get rid of the flicker. And I thought, well, that sounds good. Let's try and do that. And I, I, I found it speeded up the whole thing. Because you didn't have what what I was doing was unplotting all the last kind of things in in the room, hmm. including the room itself, and then plotting the new position. And of course, in between you you've got blank, which which kind of calls the flicker. So so hmm. I got a much faster frame rate and um, got rid of the flicker. Hmm. But and, and in hindsight, I I should have kept it dark, and I. That was just trying to make it look completely different because I think I lost some of the atmosphere doing that. But it's yeah. a shame. Houston said the same thing, but not not until after it was published. If it had said before, I, that's something I could have easily have corrected. Yeah, just, just sort of reversed all, all the graphics. Mm. But there was something about um, like having a dark screen and and suggesting things kind of sometimes work a lot better in your imagination than sort of mm. showing them. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was just trying to show off my new graphic system and the fact that I could put more <laughs> graphics on the screen. But, you know, there you are. <laughs> um, Quasitron, that was one of my favourite games as well. Um, how did you get the idea for that? Well, I I've been looking at um, things like like Night Law and um, there, there were there were a couple other um, isometric games, and I thought, how do they do that? And, mm. and I, I started experimenting, just trying to work out well how how I'd do that. Mm. And I, I, I was thinking about the, the graphics, and I was thinking, oh, you can't have all the graphics pre kind of drawn. You'd run out of space in the machine. And I, yeah. I worked out well if I had the graphics built a little components, which, which um. Were, were a series of diamonds for the floor and parallelograms for the walls. I could piece them all together like a jigsaw puzzle to get get a huge kind of scene that, that looked like the isometric games, but was very cheap hmm. on on graphics. Hmm. And I I thought, well, let's just try that idea. And and uh, I I did that, and and it, it looked very pretty. The the only thing was the the initial thing took me quite a, a a while to draw which was why i couldn't scroll it within the game mm. and i i built the back screen and um what it did is as as it scrolled around was was just kind of add new columns to the back screen or, or a new row at the top or the, the bottom of the screen now i had intended to to do that while the game was running but the poor old spectrum just 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 didn't, <laughs> couldn't handle that so but uh, i i had this kind of display engine and i i called it ziggurat because the thing looked look, looked a bit like a old fashioned ziggurat and i took it to Houston's. he said wow i really like the look of that but what's the game going to be and i had no idea of what game to put on it all i knew that um because i had slopes on it, it i needed something to run about on the slopes hmm. that i didn't have to uh, kind of um tilt to go up the slopes because that would have cost me too many graphics mm. so so i 
I thought, well, what if I did a little robot that ran on a, a point? And, and I started experimenting with different shapes. And I found, yeah, if he's got a, a real kind of pointed foot, then, mm. then it looks OK running up the ramps. It doesn't look as though the graphics going into the ramps. And it was about that time when Paradroid was really selling well. And Andrew said, look, there's no way you're going to be able to do Paradroid on the Spectrum because it relies on the scrolling. Mm. Why don't you put the Paradroid logic onto the, the, the Ziggurat design? Because mm. top down, it, it was actually logically the same design. It, it was a, a series of areas. Um, instead of walls, you, you've got cliffs to fall off of. And, and I realised, yeah, the same thing would work. I could put patrol points, just like Andrew had, to, to run droids from place to place. I could have weapons. And and so I married up my graphic mm. design with, with with his game. And uh, it was, from that point, it was very, very quick, kind of getting that all working. Mm. Yeah, I really like the grappling part of it as well. Yes, because the the grapple game itself was was an exact pull. For, I, I I took Andrew's code and just converted it to Z eighty for for that mm. part. Um, but I, I thought, okay, well let's let's just go a little bit further than than Andrew did. So so rather than just take over the robot in its entirety, I I let you kind of nick its parts. Right. <laughs> so, so you you because I. And the main reason for that was I, I had the, the KLP2 character mm. and I didn't want to lose him and replace that with the other robot. So I needed a reason why why he still looks the same as he did. So I think, OK, well, if you're taking their parts and installing them in your robot, you'll still look like the same robot. Mm. So, so yeah. it kind of came about from that that kind of graphical design point of view i had to invent gameplay to kind of support that yeah oh it's a great game um well eventually um you used to run into a few uh, financial problems didn't they and you had to sort of uh, go to a different publisher um how difficult was that did andrew take it well no no i i remember a computer show and yeah you know, when when it was done and dusted i, I went up to see him so i'm sorry i've got a couple of bombshells to drop one, I'm I'm going to um, telecom soft, and and two, they, they've agreed to publish uh, the games that that we we were currently writing. Mm. And at, at the time, he his staff were were phoning me up, and and they told me that yeah, you know, the company's finished, get out, otherwise you you're doomed, kind of thing. Mm. His his second in command um, actually moved to telecom soft, and it was her. That, that really kind of um you know phoned us up and said look yeah you, know, you need to, to come if if you're not your games are just gonna they're not going to be published there's yeah. no way he can survive I know because I yeah you know, I I had to leave and um, and whatever mm. and we we really thought it's, it's the only way we could survive because losing two games at the same time mm. And, and we didn't have any advances in those days. That, that meant, okay, we're, we're going to have six months maybe without royalties coming in. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, we, we just didn't have, have the money to do that. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, it, it just seemed like a sound de decision. And um, by the skin of his teeth, he managed to, to survive. But I think he had, had help um from Jeff Brown because Jeff Brown announced it at the same computer show and said, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm back in Houston." And uh, you know he was back in business, but we 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 got over it and we actually um, went back to Houston because that was the only way Andrew could do Paradroid ninety. Yeah, we we, we we approached a couple of other publishers and they said, "No, you know, we don't want to get into a fight with Houston." So so. Um, when uh, Houston did approach us later on and said, well, you know, any chance of you working for us again? I said, well, we've, you know, we've got these plans for Paradoid 90, but mm. I want a proper contract and I want advances. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and Because we, we didn't really have contracts for, for each game, which is why we felt in such a precarious position. Yeah. So, so this time we, we, we got everything kind of um, 
you know, sorted out. And yeah. uh, it all, all went all, you know, very good, first of all. And until, I mean, they, this time he really did go bust. Mm. And, and yeah, yeah, you know, it was a shame. And it was slightly late on, <clears throat> excuse me. It was later on in the product cycle, we'd actually given him the master. Mm. And um, someone told uh, Andrew Braybrook, um, he's not going to publish the game, he's just sold it to Activision. Right. And we were absolutely devastated because uh, the worst thing a publisher can do is not publish the game themselves. Yeah. Because if, if, the, if they license it to someone else or sell it to, to someone else, you're just going to get a royalty of that rather rather than get the royalty of the sales which, which um is the only way you're going to go and get a decent amount for the game yeah but, but, but it was a shame we were also doing a, a pc engine version right and we'd had a couple of advances for that and because I, 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 I don't recall that um we either didn't get any advances for the the uh amiga version or they, they were very small because I don't think we earned any money out of the Amiga Atari ST version at all the PC engine version at least we got some advance but mm. we were going to get royalties on that plus further advances which was a really really substantial deal at the time yeah but unfortunately when when um, Houston did go bust that time the the firm Hudson Soft who were dealing with us just said well, we didn't know that Graphgold were, do, were doing the development. We thought it was being done in house with Houston. Send us all the kit back, and, and I, I said to them, "Well, we we can't finish the game if you have the kit back. We're almost there. Just let us finish the game, mm. and then, yeah, you, know, you can sort this out, and we can talk about publishing anyway." And uh, th they insisted we we sell the kit back unless I could get from Houston a little note that said that he had no interest in the game. And by that time, he, he'd he um, started up with, with his friend, 21st Century, bought the, the any rights that Hewson could sell, which is the way the, the receiver put it, and probably was the wording of, of what he actually bought. And so, so you had this thing where you didn't really know, unless you mm -hmm. tested it in a, in a call, did he have any rights to it? Did he not? So I needed him to sign this bit of paper. And when I asked him, he says, well, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. Hudson Soft also re revealed um, that there'd been other payments made to him of advances, which we, we thought hadn't been made yet, which we were waiting for. So... Yeah, um, unfortunately, Hudson Soft had paid out a lot of money for it. Even so, there was still one advance they hadn't paid. And I said, look, you know, we could still make this work for the remainder of the, the advances and and um, the royalty that we were going to get for cartridge. Hmm. But eventually, I got um, the MD of uh, 21st Century because uh, Houston wasn't the MD. I, I don't know whether he was disallowed from being the MD, but the, his his friend was the MD in a new company. He actually agreed to get me the note, and I got the note, immediately faxed it over to Hudson Soft. I said, sorry, it's too late. It, that took me about two, three months mm -hmm. to, to do. And I said, no, we've already written it off. And, you know, it's... it's we're, we're, once the game's written off, that's it. We don't. It's off our schedule, and uh, mm. you know, it, it, it was just such a shame. That was a really good version of the game as well. It was it was the best mm. version of the game. So we ended up, you know, not getting any royalties at all from Paradon Knight and the Amiga and ST version, and uh, at least we'd got got the first advance maybe one or two for the PC engine version, but you know, basically did all that work for, for next to nothing. No, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> it's, a, it's the way the business was at, at the time. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, did you find it quite difficult moving on to the 16-bit machines? The, the difficulty was we were ready to move on, but the publishers weren't. 
Houston mm. didn't want to. He, he, he wasn't sure which machine to back. And we said, well, yeah, go for the Atari and Amiga. Mm. And about the nearest he, he got, he he commissioned a a rather cheap com- uh, conversion of Rana Rama to the Atari ST, mm. um, mainly because the, the programmer who did that wanted to learn all about the, the Atari ST. But he... He, he kind of didn't do how we'd convert it. We, we always would make the game better and think, well, what could the Atari ST do? He, he basically converted the code. And you can mm. see even the animations, like they're very jerky and fast because he used the same timing loops that, that were in the spectrum rather than like mm. cater for the new machine or add frames because he's got ma- massive more graphic space. Mm. Uh, um, John Cumming, the in-house programmer at... Uh, Houston redid all the, the graphics because w- when it came, it had all the original graphics, spectrum graphics in. And, you know, John said, oh, you can't put those out. So he, he did lots of uh, floor tiles and, and new sprites mm. and, and whatever. But w- when we moved to Telecom Soft, that was one of the, the things that attracted us. They said, we want you to, you yeah, know, we'll pay you to start a, pro- a project off on, on the Amiga and NST, mm. and you know, it's, we expect it to take time, and it will be a big project. Something to via. I think they they had made a lot of money out of carrier command, so they wanted you know some, something to to do that. So Dominic Robertson, who um, used to work at Houston, came to work for us, and and that's what we got him doing. But during the the writing of that, they kind of mm. changed their mind. I, I suppose the sales weren't there for, for a while, and and they they were pushing us for 8-bit titles, and we had this contract where I think we had to produce four 8-bit titles across um, Commodore 64 and Spectrum, Mm. and we just seemed to be ages kind of doing these um, 8-bit titles to to fulfil that part of the contract, and um, by the time we... We delivered a sort of batch of them. They were dumped on the market, and uh, we've hardly any advertising. Yeah. I don't know whether you remember the Soldier of Fortune advertising. There, there was oh, a yeah. picture yeah. of Humphrey Bogart in black and white at a train station. Mm. Uh, and uh, that was it. That was the advertising campaign. Nothing to kind of um, you know make a game player excited. Mm. It's a shame because the Soldier of Fortune was a very very Good little game on the spectrum. I think it ran at uh, half the frame rate, which very few uh, spectrum games achieved. Hmm. And on on the C sixty four again, it was a very very good little player full scroller. But yeah, hmm. uh, most most players have never even seen them. Yeah, <laughs> you eventually moved on to consoles as well, didn't you? We did, and and that that was. Um, I mean, the, the PC Engine was our first sort of venture into consoles. Mm. That that went wrong. But very soon after that, uh, Renegade asked us to convert gods mm. onto, I think, I think it was the Mega Drive, which which Gary Foreman did. And at, at the time, we were were talking to Virgin, and, and they came along and um, said, oh, we need um, this on the master system and then this on the master system and uh we had a whole series of of eight bit games that we did for them we, we also supplied graphics or sound for for other developers mm. for them and and that, that became really really ludicrous uh, uh lucrative <laughs> uh, a ludicrous amount of money it was too <laughs> It was the first time that that we, because um, for these games they weren't for royalties, mm. they, they they were for strict amounts of money, but you you got the money kind of as, as you did the work. So we were actually making a profit as as we kind of went along then, rather than spending all all our time writing an original product. Sometimes for advances in those days, but but more often for not enough advances to pay for for the game and and then at the end of the day you know, you, you put it onto the market and it's like throwing a dice and you know if you get a one well that's it you've lost a lot of money mm. and worse than that 
the dice kept getting lost because the amount of um, publishers that, that went down or, or the games that, that we we did that never kind of materialised, like Fire and Ice on, on the Mega Drive, mm. uh, n- never got published. I think the Master System one did. Um, oh, there's, there's a whole s- string of of um, games that, that uh, w- we had problems with. E- even uh, Rainbow Islands, mm. we, we got into converting arcade machines when uh, telecom soft that they were let down by someone and and said can you can you quickly convert flying shark mm. um to to the spectrum and Amstrad and we need it in six weeks so uh dominic said oh yeah i can do that so we we did that and then we got given rainbow islands to to do and and that that, that gave us quite a reputation and it, i think it was virgin seeing the rainbow islands that 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 kind of made them think oh yeah we we can do these consoles hmm. we we were doing um for for mirasoft a uh, total recall hmm. on i think it was the mega drive but because that, that that was a product that got cancelled when mirasoft went bust so uh, yeah, it was quite a quite a hairy um, experience in those those days. I I was dealing with perhaps four publishers at a time, thinking, mm. well, okay, if half of them go down, we can just about keep alive with the other half. Yeah, and it, it was amazing because because within um, a, a few weeks, Activision, Mirasoft, and Houston's all went down. So three of my Four publishers and telecom sold out to off to microprose um and so, so even if your publisher kind of survived like like you ended up in someone else's bed that mm. it, it, it was a very 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 sort of strange time you i think um thinking of all the products that we did there was hardly a product that we started off and got published by the same publisher yeah <laughs> like like fire and ice we actually started off with mirasoft mm. but i had a, a clause i put in the contract saying that if they went insolvent mm. um we get the total rights back mm. and um we, we invoked that clause and then we took it to renegade mm. So, so even that that one went over two publishers, and then we started doing motocross for Renegade. But by the time that was finished, they'd um, sold out to Warner, mm. and then Warner had sold motocross on to uh, another outfit. I can't even remember the name. And it, the the whole thing kind of means that the publication gets delayed. You you means your royalties are going to get delayed and without the royalties well what you're going to use to build the next game mm. so it, it was a kind of real kind of um add up the money and have i got the money to pay the wages at the end of the month <laughs> uh. for, for, for a while but the consoles coming back back to them they kind of gave us a bit of cash and uh, like allowed us to keep going but the problem was um there came a day when the 8-bit consoles were just not wanted anymore and we had quite a, a, almost half the team working on 8-bit consoles mm. and all of a sudden I got no more contracts. I, I put in a couple of bids for them and they said oh no that's far too high and I was only putting the kind of bid that we'd put before mm. and uh, that was it. We didn't get any more from that, that day and there, there was nothing I could do. Some of the people really... Um, were specialised in the eight bit consoles and and weren't ready to take on anything else, mm. um, because the but by by that time, uh, PlayStation was around the corner. We were moving into three D graphics, so the, so the old ki- kind of um, cartoony pixel artists were, were were really just just overnight made redundant, and some of the programmers too. And it was a shame. I had to let a, a lot of people go. So I always kind of try to get them other jobs. I used to phone around all all the people I knew, 
like sensible software, um, mm. bitmap brothers, and, and got got a load of positions with, with other companies. But it, it was nice to know how um, well thought of Graph Gold staff were. You know, you just used to mm -hmm. say, "Oh, yeah, yeah, it sounds, oh yeah, yeah." If you know, I'd give a list of what they'd done. Oh yeah, yeah, if send them up to us and. Mm. Hmm. Did you find it difficult um, being both a programmer and a manager at the same time? It it was difficult, and there the, there came a time when we started getting into the three D stuff, where I just didn't have time to do both. So I hmm. I actually employed Kevin Holloway. I mean, he had worked to me before as a programmer, but he also worked. Um, in publishing houses so so he, he he had a good sort of smattering in industry so I, I brought him back as, as um, programmer manager to to manage the, the kind of office and he was also um, touting around our designs trying uh, visiting the publishers so he was doing a lot of the stuff that I was doing and that that took up one hell of a time because by yeah. the time you've traveled even up somewhere close like like London, um, you know, I had a lunch with people, showed them the game and come back. That's, that's the day gone. And yeah, I, I just didn't have time to do it. So he did that. And I, I actually gave him my manager's desk and went back upstairs with the programmers and wrote a 3D engine for the PC. Because hmm. the PlayStation had its own 3D engine, but but we didn't have anything for the PC. And, and hmm. uh, you know, we needed to, to do that. So... So I, I kind of decided that's my special expertise. I, I, I can tackle these these kind of problems and come come out of them. And it, it, mm. I mean that that particular one, I had it up and running in a week. Um, but but I I did buy a book on 3D that came with a kind of um, basis of an engine. So I kind of took that and ripped it apart and kind of put it all back together and you know used the bits of it that that. I could do and then started um rewriting all, all the plot routines to make them more efficient and, mm. and things and, and got it working but they, they were scary moments because we had a milestone to deliver and we, we had no 3d engine in the pc version we we're meant to be doing a kind of parallel development mm. but, but but i yeah i managed to do it so mm. Hmm. So after, after graph gold what happened uh, in your life what what did you do after graph gold I earned some money, basically. <laughs> <laughs> the, the end of Graph Guard, I wasn't paying myself. Mm. Um, our payments stopped coming through from Perfect Entertainment, it, just all of a sudden, in, instead of our monthly payroll coming through, we had nothing. Um, so so I, I just didn't get anything. Um, my other source of income was the rent off the office, but again, Perfect Entertainment stopped paying that. Hmm. So I, I was left high and dry and ju just virtually every bit of money that I had w was gone. Hmm. So um, and Andrew found a job at, at a place called Eurobase in Chelmsford writing insurance software. And I thought, well, I know how to do that. I used to do that before I, I wrote games. And hmm. um, they actually had a thing where you got paid a thousand pounds if you could find another staff member to come and work for them so mm. so he put my name forward i went for the interview and it, yeah he got the money for it <laughs> <laughs> so so and it was such a relief kind of having money come in every month mm. that, that even when I, I was offered um by mike montgomery he said come and work for me mm. um i i just just kind of wasn't interested in i i was kind of almost traumatized the the nearest i could i can sort of describe like watching your your company fall apart and having to clear off all the machines and sell off everything and mm. you, know, you know strip strip the office it's like a bereavement it leaves you with the same sort of sense of loss and mm. i i just didn't want to have anything to do with the industry for a while mm. And and I could just bury myself in into the technical problems of this this other company, and I I, I soon got moved to their technical department because I realised I I knew what I was talking about. So yes. so I I got moved to the R and D team, and uh, really enjoyed that for for 
quite quite a while. But in the end, the internal politics of that kind of got me down a bit. I, I must have spent 15 years there. Hmm. Uh, and my wage was, you know, went, went up and up. So it, it made it more and more difficult to to kind of leave a, a guaranteed wage for, mm. for uh, an industry where, where you know, you, you're lucky if you get anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said that you've uh, been working on a, a new project for the last six years. Um, can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost ready to put the first version up on, on Steam. And Oh, right. I, I thought, well, I'll go right back to my roots and I'll write 3D Space Wars as I would write it now. Mm. And the the idea, crazy, now I look back at it, but I thought, I'm going to do it like we did in the old days. I'm going to do every bit myself, the mm. music, the graphics, all the programming, just so it's totally me and I get the feel of game that I want. Because it... When you work with other people, even when you're the boss, it's kind of like a design committee and, and kind mm. of, you know, you, your ideas get watered down. You need to kind of get, get other people's sort, sort of input in it. I, I wanted to go back to, to how I originally started, mm. but I, I was only doing it, first of all. Oh, my screen's all gone. Uh... Oh, I can still see you. Oh, back again. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Maybe I was trying to hibernate or, or something like, like that. Yes, so um, I, I had this idea of doing the whole game myself, and, and I'd, I'd been working on on the, the game engine for sort of ever since I left I, in, in my mm. lunch hours at work. I, I've I was putting ideas together for a three D engine, and and Ooh. I just seemed forever going up Windows versions and DirectX versions and Visual Studio versions, and having to rewrite code for the, their latest sort of ideas. So mm. it seemed to spend more idea, more time doing that than anything else. But I I thought let's let's make this a space game, and it was only meant to be a kind of like a shoot 'em up. But I thought, well, rather than just a shoot 'em up, I, I want you things strategically to fight. I didn't want to make it a strategy game, but I wanted to make the fights meaningful. Mm. So I thought, okay, well, if if I put um, space bases and supply routes, and you've got to try and protect the spy, the 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 routes, and and then I thought, okay, well, let, let's do it so so that um, the the space stations, rather than all all just be there, um, that they're being created and all put in place and, and you that's sort of one of the things that you can participate in so so basically the the, the player now you you can um do, do the standard things they have in these sort of games like like mine asteroids um you can build space stations you can take goods from one place to another and um, and then while i was doing it to uh kind of make it easier to test I made mm. the computer able to take over the player. And then I thought, oh, I rather like it like that. I think I'll leave, leave it like that. And um, so I could test more than one mission at once. I, I let the player have more than one ship. And I thought, oh, I rather like that. So so you you actually have a, like a little um, mini fleet of, of ships that you can either put in one squad and all take on the same mission mm. or, or you can send off all over the place but at any time you can say right I, I want to manually drive that ship so rather than having to do the boring bits that there always seem to be in space games because they're, they're big and you've got to travel you, you, you can just monitor your ships and then you can just take over and do do the bit that you like to do or if mm. you're useless at flying or landing you can switch to the ai and let the ai pilot j just land mm. so it, it kind of one of the ideas I wanted, I, I wanted it to play. I'd been playing Battlestar Galactica online, mm. and I rather like playing in squads and with other players. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if gay, if you couldn't tell whether the AI ships were player ships or not? So I gave them all kind of little, little um, 
log names and, and they communicate with you and say, do you want to join them, whatever, and can lead you on missions or, or the, they can join your squads. So mm. as well as you, you, you having a squad of your own ships, you, you can just have one of your ships and then recruit other people mm. and, and go, go on a thing with with them or you can join someone else's mission if if you don't don't feel you want to lead a mission so yes. so it's it's got very very varied kind of ways that, that that you can play it sometimes when i'm i'm kind of too tired to play i actually like just running it up sending all my little things on missions and kind of just what it's, it's it kind of it's a bit like watching ants build an ant nest as <laughs> they all go and they, they put the space station together and of course, sooner or later, you meet the, the old enemy, the side ant, who are mm. doing the same thing. And um, when they meet you, of course, um, they don't want you there. So so it, it becomes a huge 3D space war. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, uh, I, I always loved, I remember the day when I found out that say, is uh, bad is backwards. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and and in in this game they're, they're not actually aliens what what, what they are is, is a, an earlier earth mission that that's been sort of sent out and they've lost all contact through them and they've built they were sent to kind of um pioneer space and build all these space stations and get it ready for the humans to go up there but they lost mm. contact with them but their their programming has kind of just changed so that so they've gone rogue so they see earth as a competing resource mm. so, so you're actually fighting against very similar technology so oh. they're trying to build all the bases and do exactly the same thing as as you are right which which makes it quite interesting and also an excuse because I haven't got time to do uh, two complete full sets of ships and graphics. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought, well, what, what the hell do I do? I, I, I can't model 3D graphics. So I, I um, built a ship designer and in, in it allows me to model pieces of ships. Yeah. And within the game, you, you can put the pieces of ships together and build your own ships as, as well as they're being kind of preset de designs. Mm. And that's the way the kind of bases work. They're all built out of kind of kind of pieces. Yeah. So it's, it's, and not, not only that, each piece has its own way, its own kind of power requirements and, and whatever. So the, the, the ship's physics like react to, to how you build them so if you build it too long they're very sluggish because long things are difficult to turn around hmm. if you put more engines on you're going to get more acceleration etc etc hmm. so, so and, and that 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 um took a quite quite a while to get right because to get hmm. the balance so that all the physics kind of gives you a, a playable ship but it's yes. you know so that a, a space carrier feels more you know, you know, sluggish and mm. th than a, a fighter and the fighter feels re really nippy and yeah. to get them so that you know, no matter how many shields or weapons that you put on them that, that the hierarchy of their, their strengths all, all kind of works that, that's taken a lot of long while to do but perhaps the biggest thing was getting the AI right it's the most complicated AI that I've ever had in, in a game because I, I wanted the all, all the AI ships to look like player ships and and so that they were able to do anything that the player can do yeah it's, it's really interesting what watching them because like when when they um as, as say one in a dock at a, a space station the, the ships all queue up behind each other <laughs> um, it, it's a busy game it's not you know most space games you you see sort of two or three ships on on the screen if, if you're lucky or if you you connive with other players you might might get a group together but mm. there's ships beetling about if, everywhere it's more like um yeah yeah sometimes you can you can actually get a traffic jam at uh <laughs> a base yeah with, with all the ships coming trying to pick up goods and and landing and they're, they're landing the whole whole time you know boom one lands and you see the little containers um, come out the station and they, they they carry kind of little trains of containers behind them mm. which which is rather cute and and um you, you're not bound to to go on the missions you you can do the missions if you want if if you want you can just fly about 
Hmm. And if you see some something like an asteroid with lots of gold in it, you, you can just pick it up and and take it to a space station and kind of you're almost constructing your own mission just by your actions. You can do that or you can just go and try and find the enemy and uh, fight hmm. them if you want. But, but you get more points if, if if you do the missions and you do them successfully then, then you get mm. you get experience points which puts you up the rankings and you also get money which you can buy new ships with mm. so, so you you know you, you can gradually build build or order more and better ships yeah i think the maximum is, is about eight ships that, that you can have but there's plenty to look after <laughs> so, have you got a name for the game yet at the moment, it's called Deepest Blue. Hmm. But it's sort of subtitled The Return of the Side Ab. <laughs> Brilliant, Sam. Well, thanks so much for doing this uh, chat. It's been really interesting. It's been fascinating. Uh, thanks for uh, taking part. That's all right. Um, right, well, uh, let us know when the game's out. Anyway, and I'll, uh, I'll try to publicise it from my side for you because we're looking forward to it. It's like sort of like Elite, but better, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, okay, well, thanks again, mate. I'm going to end the uh, interview, but uh, thanks again, and I'll let you know when it's up on the website. Yep, yeah, okay. All right. Cheers again, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.